Hello everybody, it's Grandmama. Time for another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherax. Today's story, Babbitt Joe Alexander. Hello there. We've got the scrapbook open tonight to a story of one of Grays Harbor's colorful little characters of the past, who once set what is probably a record for slow travel over the state's Cascade Mountains. In this day of speed and more speed, when they're talking about New York to San Francisco in three hours with jets, it's time to take a look backwards and see how it used to be. When the old timers get to measuring things, they can't recall a yardstick for slow travel that compared with Babbitt Joe Alexander's trek from Roslyn, Washington to Grays Harbor in a steam tractor. Some of you may remember Babbitt Joe Alexander. He had a lot of connections here on the harbor, particularly in Cosmopolis, which was his hometown. He got his name because he was the handiest man with a chunk of Babbitt they ever worked on a donkey engine. Let the big dole bear go down for a broken part and Joe was on it, hammering, tinkering, and putting it back together again. And it didn't take long and there were mighty few breakdowns that, would, that wouldn't respond to Joe's treatment. Well, that was Babbitt Joe, a close relative, incidentally, of Gray's Harbor, whose watch chain po politician and log man, Eddie Alexander. And after Dick has had a few words from our sponsor, we'll be back with the story of Babbitt Joe, Andy Smith, and the Harvest Tractor. Here you go, Dick. The year was 1912, and if you remember 1912, it was quite a year for Gray's Harbor camps and sawmills. So Babbitt Joe, who used to keep the donkeys running in the camps for the old Grays Harbor Commercial Company, was walking the street in Cosmopolis wondering what to do. Today most folks just sit down and let government worry about what they should be doing, but not Babbitt Joe. He had a hankering to be busy. And he kept his ear in tune to the sound of jobs somewhere. And finally he caught the sound of a job on the downwind. He was in Dan Spiegel's drugstore, Dan was the town druggist, operated the telephone exchange, and acted as Cosmopolis's city treasurer. But probably his greatest claim to fame would be that he was the father of that ethereal apparition that folks hereabouts came to know as Doodlebug. Joe was in Dan Spiegel's drugstore talking to a few fellows who had just come down from Melbourne and he picked up the information that Andy Smith up near Brady was looking for a man to do a highly specialized job of chauffeuring. It was a hauling job, and the informant described it, but it would take a man with some engineering experience. Joe liked the sound of that, and the next day he got off the morning train at Brady and hiked out to Andrew Smith's place. Now, for you old-timers, you don't need to identify Andy Smith. He was a figure in the county for years. For some of the newcomers, we might identify Andy Smith as the father of Oscar Smith for a generation custodian of the fair share of Grace Harbor's milk supply and an active leader in civic affairs. But back there in 1912, Oscar was serving his apprenticeship in butter fat and cottage cheese. Well, Babbitt Joe found Andy Smith and they got down to the case. Andy was, among others, one of Grace Harbor's first automobile salesmen. He sold cars to up-county folk out of his bar big barn. But it was not an automobile job that he had in mind. The fact was, he thought farming in Grace Harbor had progressed far enough to experiment with a full-size harvester tractor, the kind that was used to tow and operate the big combines that moved and threshed the great wheat fields east of the mountains. Andy thought that it might be possible to pick up a second-hand harvester, drive it over the mountains to Grace Harbor, and put it to work here during the harvest season. 
He would contract for the harvest work on farms up and down the valley. It was an experiment that didn't warrant buying a harvest tractor, but a good used one was, wor was a worthwhile risk. Now, what he wanted Joe for was to go over to Roslyn, Washington, where he heard there was a good used tractor and drive it back. Would Joe take the job? Well, if you know Joe Alexander, you know the answer. Joe would take any job that sounded interesting, and right now he would take any job no matter how it sounded. So he took the offer and shook his hand, and two days later in Smith's wheezy 1912 motor car, they climbed the steep roads of the Cascades and wound down the other side into the valleys where harvesting machines were common. They found their harvest tractor all right in Roslyn. It was the right kind, the right size, in good condition, and the price interested the promoter Smith. When the papers had been signed and the checks written, Babbitt Joe rolled up his sleeves to find out what made this monster tick, and Andy Smith climbed back into his snorting horseless carriage and started for Brady. Now, I don't know whether many of you are familiar with the threshing engines of a combine tractor, but those engines are nothing short of awesome. They are about the size of a small locomotive, and this metal was geared to rear up and tear along the road at a speed of three and a half miles per hour. Joe took a few lessons on the engine, estimated his requirements, and made his plan. The boiler consumed wood. There was room in the cab for only about enough wood to take the monster ten miles. Joe solved that problem by trading a farmer out of a flatbed wagon. He cut off the tongue and made it into one of the first trailers ever to negotiate the highways of the state. He spent a day loading the wagon with wood, which in part, in that part of the state, consisted of gathering up old fence posts, fence rails, and occasionally dead tree or two that were downed by the streams, or picking up old ties down near the railroad tracks. Then, one morning in the early summer of 1912, Babbitt Joe Alexander was up ahead of the sun and had a head of steam in his boiler. When the wheat field still rolled, shadowless in the pre-dawn haze, he pointed his rumbling monster west and opened up the throttle. Now harvesting equipment rolling up a road in eastern Washington isn't an exciting sight. And it, was, and it wasn't back in those days either. The equipment is commonly on the road early and late during the harvest season as it rolls along from one farm to another. But the ranchers could tell from Joe's heaping wagon load of fuel that he was planning a long trip at least. He planned to burn a lot of wood. Joe took the main highway and with the governor spinning wide open he lunged ahead. At three and a half miles per hour many teams of horses passed him at their ambling gait, but Joe didn't mind. There was only one thing that really concerned him the first day. How long would the fuel last? And he figured on covering 30 miles a day. And when the middle of the second day, the original supply of wood was exhausted, he was already scorching the fields and rivers and the bottoms for more wood to be used. He could see that he had figured on better times than he would actually make. There was another problem. As he approached the small towns, he would be met at the city limits by a police officer, the town constable, or other vested authority, and detoured around the town. We don't want our main streets torn up, he said. The detour added miles to his itinerary. And in his conveyance, the detour of three miles met at least an hour. One evening, when Joe was looking for a good place to park his steam-blowing dragon, it developed an ailment, wheezing and snorting to a stop. Joe spent most of the night making repairs by candlelight. But when the thing operated on schedule, his day ended at dusk, and he spent the last minutes of daylight scouring for wood, filling the water tanks, and getting himself bedded down for the night. He had his mills well worked out. His coffee pot was fitted with a long handle that made it possible to set it in the opening of the firebox and bring water to a boil while the big engine roared along the highway. By a similar method, he could boil eggs, vegetables, and once in a while a chicken without stopping. 
He ate as he traveled. He had a little company, and his social activities during the junket was limited to waving at an occasional curious onlooker as he passed a country house or detoured around a hamlet. Sometimes the teamster would slow down with horse-drawn conveyances to chat with Joe above the roaring engine, but it was poor conversation. The horses shielded away from the spinning flywheel, and both the conversationalist had to shout at the top of their voices to be heard by the other. The chat usually consisted of, where are you going? And the answer, hope you make it. And another answer, I'm not so sure. And most of 10, the teamster drove away laughing as he thought of Joe rolling through the mountain passes on the big threshing engine. Well, Joe had plenty of trouble when he got to the metropolis areas. He had some detours near Tacoma that took him all day long to negotiate. At Olympia, they first refused to permit him to go through the town and finally allowed him to make a run after dark, providing that the lanterns hung on the vehicle in conspicuous places. Twice he wrote letters to Andy Smith to ensure him that he was heading in the right direction and still coming. Once he was into the mountainous country and west, he had no more troubles with wood. But there were nights when water was hard to was a hard commodity to locate. The adequate supply of wood sped things up, but the problem of getting around the larger towns and cities more than compensated for it. His speed didn't increase a mile, but Babbitt Joe Alexander was not one to complain, and there was a streak of determination in, the, in his foot wide. He would not give up. Weeks went by. Babbitt Joe kept at it. Wednesday was the same as Sunday to him, Saturday night the same as Tuesday morning, but all things must come to an end when someone like Babbitt Joe was managing them, and one morning in the midsummer, the smoke of his snorting machine had a pattern in the sky near Brady, and the rumble of the giant was frightening the cows on the Chehalis Valley farmers. That night, Although it meant running two hours after darkness, Joe finished the long journey to Andrew Smith's barn and delivered his charge. Andy Smith had been in touch with him for miles. In fact, the day before, he had driven up the road a piece and spotted Joe. They had talked it over, and Joe had reckoned that he might make it in the next night. Well, Joe climbed out of the cab for the last time the most traveled man in the state for the distance he had gone. He collected his guarantee for delivering the monster. Then he sat down to figure his time from Rosalind to Brady. He probably set a record that stands to this day, for it took him not just days, and not only weeks, but a week more than a full month to pilot this harvest engine over the mountains to be delivered the first steam harvester engine to Andy Smith that Grace Harbor had ever seen. And now a few words from Dick our, and our sponsors. And now I want to say a word to the real old timers, the listeners in our audience who knew Babbitt Joe Alexander, Doc Maker, Dick Faulkner, the Hopium Committee that created the Stone Man, and the many others that we have talked about. We're building up quite a library of Grays Harbor history. Sometimes we get the stories from one source, and someone tells us that it didn't happen that way. It was the other side of the street, or it was autumn, not spring. Many of my stories come from the old documents, Jim Cannery's Aberdeen Herald, the old Aberdeen Bulletin, and the Hope We Am Washingtonian. Some materials I can check with a copy, of the many old city directories that I have dating back to the beginning of the century. But sometimes we get a version that doesn't agree with the other. When that happens, drop us a line. Just a post with a note on it. Or give us the phone call here at the station. We're always anxious to get the old timers view of our scrapbook. Because these people that we talk about mostly, we can only remember as having been here way back when. We were not personally acquainted them, with them. Our stories are for the most part secondhand. So do what a lot of friends and listeners do from time to time. Give us a call or drop us a card about the story that you can add to, correct, or give a different twist to. 
We all welcome it. Besides, it's your story after all, as much as it is mine, for we all share in these interests in our community. The Grays Harbor that we find here in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.